He goes by many names. In Italy, they call him Fantamon. In Brazil, he goes by Fantoma. And in Japan, they simply call him the Golden Bat. Today's anime is about a skeleton wearing a cape, and he's probably one of the most important characters that you've never heard of. <laughs> So in this video, I'm going to cover every single aspect of Golden Bat, and even stuff that Wikipedia doesn't know about. So with that said, let's start with the anime. Released in 1967, Golden Bat is a TV series about a group of kids traveling the Earth under the great Professor Yamatone. When he's not inventing rocket fuel or solving world hunger, he's traveling the planet in his flying supercar. Every episode, him and his group of kids travel the world, but in the first episode, it's all about this giant monster that's appeared somewhere off the coast of Antarctica. A ship has set sail for the lost city of Atlantis, but as soon as they get close, they get attacked by a sea monster, leaving a young girl as the sole survivor. Picking up the distress signal, a UFO flies in and rescues her, but no sooner do they escape, they end up crash landing on the lost city of Atlantis. It's there that they discover a gold sarcophagus, and using the research that her father left her, the young girl revives the greatest hero who has ever lived. And thus, Golden Bat awakens from his 10,000 year sleep to fight for justice and save the world from evil. And from then on, the show has these kids bumping into monsters, solving mysteries, and slowly building towards fights with the superhero Golden Bat. Thankfully, they don't call on him unless they absolutely have to, and this is kind of important because Golden Bat is one of the most invincible characters that I have ever seen. You can't freeze him, he doesn't mind if you light him on fire, and I'm pretty sure he summoned a tornado one time. Also, he can teleport. Did I mention he's basically magic? As a skeleton magician from beyond time and space, Golden Bat's power level is only limited by your imagination and how fast they could draw it. Half the fun is just seeing what kind of crazy thing that he'll fight next. This was right in the middle of the late 1960s kaiju boom, so he fought as many creatures as skeletonly possible. It's not the fact that he has every power imaginable that I love about him, it's how he actually fights. Most heroes have a catchphrase, but he does things a little bit different. Instead, he'll just laugh in your face and throw an entire building at you. <laughs> All these monsters are being thrown at him by the great Dr. Nazo, one of the most evil supervillains of all time. I absolutely love this guy. He's half scientist, half UFO, and 100% evil. He puts the mad in mad scientists. When I think of OG supervillains, I think of Dr. Nazo. He once stole all the water in a river just so he could steal all the gold at the bottom of it. Another time, he forced a village to build him a giant robot, only to turn them to dust when they finished. He's the kind of guy that doesn't wash his hands when he goes to the bathroom. Not because one of his hands is a giant claw, but because he's just that evil. Most villains would have some sort of volcano lair or something, not Nazo. He went one step further and made his entire base portable, just so he could be evil wherever he wants. It also doubles as a rocket ship, because why wouldn't it? The stories range from battles with Greek gods to episodes about science gone mad. One story, Nazo steals some kind of rocket fuel, another episode, the kids are exploring distant magical lands. It's got a good balance of adventure and monster fights. Now, even though it never aired in America, people all around the world still remember this show very well, and someone at Cartoon Network was probably a huge fan. Lapis Lazuli from Steven Universe looks a lot like a character from episode 20. That story follows an underwater kingdom and the magic pearl at the center. When Dr. Nazo finds out about its unimaginable power, he hires fish people to steal it with giant monsters and science magic. Golden Bat then proceeds to beat them so hard into the ground that they turn back into regular fish. And this isn't even the first time Steven Universe referenced this series either. Dr. Nazo has a second in command who's pretty much the only person that doesn't get turned into a pile of dust by some sort of science laser beam, and he looks a lot like this other character from Steven Universe too. I don't think they've ever said it officially, but this is the same cartoon that parodied 1970s anime Captain Harlock, so I think somebody out there must really love this show. How they actually managed to watch it is anyone's guess. 
This series never came out in America, and the English dub is almost completely lost to media. The only bit that survived is a few seconds that somebody managed to record onto a cassette tape in the 1970s. Now even though Golden Bad is pretty popular, he hasn't had an anime series since the 1960s, but that doesn't mean that they haven't tried to bring him back a couple of times. In the early 2000s, a video started circulating the internet for an anime called Golden Bat Millennium Version, but nobody really knows where it comes from. Was it a pilot for an unproduced series? Was it some sort of anniversary video? The whole thing is a complete mystery. At the bottom of the video, you can see some VHS data, so this was probably a preview at the end of some tape. The earliest reference that I can find is from 2003, on a release list for upcoming anime for that year. That same site claims that it was directed by Shinichi Watanabe, which would be pretty cool if it's true. He was the director of Excel Saga, and in fact, he worked on an episode of the anime Zetai Karin Children, and in that show, there's a very brief reference to Golden Bat. It's a shame nothing came of it, but hey, you know, what can you do? Thankfully, there is one piece of Golden Bat media that we actually can watch. In 1966, one year before the series, a live-action movie simply titled Golden Bat was released by Toei. It actually stars future mid-1970s martial arts megastar Sonny Chiba, and it's just as great as it is goofy. In this movie, the planet Icarus is careening towards Earth, and it's up to Professor Yamatone and the Pearl Research Lab to figure out how to blow it up. Meanwhile, the planet's impact is accelerated by Dr. Nazo, who's actually an alien from outer space this time. In the anime, they could just have Golden Bat do whatever they wanted, but in the movie, he's trained in the mystical art of beating people up with a stick. They had the actor wear a rubber mask, and it makes him sound even spookier. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see his face, I can't help but smile. The whole movie has this sincere goofiness that you just don't see anymore. After that, Golden Bat gives them the materials for the lens that they need to blow up the meteor that's heading towards Earth, and then the film turns into a spy movie. Hey, you know, it was in the 1960s, it was like half the movies out were spy movies. And then you throw in some kidnapping, a hijacked spaceship, and Golden Bat's classic laughing in the face of evil, you've got a pretty good fun B-movie. Toei probably made this thing just to cash in on Ultraman, which aired just a couple of months earlier, and when the movie came out in Italy, they renamed it Diabolic, which makes this his fifth name if we're counting Latin America. Over there, they call him Fantasmagorico. That's probably why you never heard of this character. Nobody knows his name! Now, the movie is pretty famous in its own right, but would you believe that the character goes back even further than the 1960s? Golden Bat has so much lost media that it borders on archaeology. Not only is he Japan's first superhero, he might be the first tokusatsu hero too. Predating the movie Supergiant by seven years, and Godzilla by four, the first Golden Bat film came out in 1950. Made by Shin Egasha and distributed by Toei, Japan's first superhero movie was called Golden Bat, Phantom of the Skyscraper. Now, unfortunately, no copies of this movie still exist, but through newspaper clippings and some insane research, I've pieced together everything that I know about it. Apparently, the plot involved Dr. Nazo and his QX gang trying to steal a new atomic energy source, and that's all we really know about it. It ends with Golden Bat saving the day, and that's all we know. It's a shame it's lost media, because Japan's entire masked hero genre starts with this one film. He's got the cape, he's got the mask, he fought villains with superpowers, I would say it counts. And yeah, I know Wikipedia says Supergiant was Japan's first superhero movie, but that's probably wrong. I mean, technically there's proto-toku stuff from before 1950, but it's all pretty much ninja movies, and nobody's ever taken a photograph of a ninja, so we'll just never know. But Kenny, you say? That doesn't make Golden Bat Japan's first superhero. I've seen every Japanese movie there is, and there's tons of characters that come before him. Well, this is to go back even further beyond. Predating Superman. Batman, an anime as we know it. Golden Bat's first known appearance can be tracked back all the way to 1931. That makes him not only Japan's very first superhero, but one of the oldest heroes worldwide. Back then, manga barely even existed, so instead they told stories with the Japanese art of Kami Shibai. 
Translated as paper theater, these slideshows laid the groundwork for the manga that we know and love today. You'd run out a stand, narrate a story, and gather a crowd of people by making some kind of sound. Nice. That's the sound. It was kind of like an ice cream truck, but instead of ice cream, it was the fantastic stories of golden bats. Performers would do all sorts of voices, and at the end everyone got candy, which automatically makes it better than anime. So yes, Japan used to lure in children with stories of talking skeletons and candy bars, but that doesn't make it any less historically accurate. In fact, it's actually still being practiced today. Check out this modern version that I found where they projected the anime on top of it. Hey, if you're not into Japanese shadow puppet theater, then you know, I don't know what to tell you. You just need to get on my level. I'd like to think someone who saw the anime as it was airing in the 1960s went, Eh, you know, the Kami Shibai was better. Yeah, anime is technically remarkable, what with bringing moving pictures to life and all, but where's the heart? You don't even get candy for watching? Anime blows! Early on, people mocked TV in Japan by calling it Electric Kami Shibai, because really, why would you pay for a TV when you could watch Golden Bat for free? Now, I don't really consider it to be manga, but they still do shows at the Kyoto Manga Museum, and who am I to argue with all of Japan, right? They were even kind enough to subtitle it too, which makes Golden Bat not only Japan's first superhero, but the first subtitled manga too. What, you guys don't watch your manga subtitled? This is probably the only time you could ever say that and be 100% right. Now, would you believe, and this is where it starts getting really, really obscure, would you believe that there's actually another Golden Bat movie based on all of this madness? In 1972, Toho released a comedy about the origins of Golden Bat called The Golden Bat Is Here. And despite being made by a major company like Toho, this movie is lost media too. The only footage I could even find is a two minute clip that somebody probably recorded onto a VHS tape when it was airing on TV in Japan and the fact that there's not one but two Lost Golden Bat films kind of amazes me. And now, we get into the really, really obscure stuff. This wasn't even the last time that they tried to reinvent Golden Bat, let alone the final time that they tried to reinvent the character. Released in 2005, Garo is a live-action gothic horror series with costumes, fighting, and so many sequels that I can't possibly cover them all. So why am I even bringing it up then, right? Well, it looks like the project started with the name Skull Z very, very early on. Originally, Keita Amamiya, creator of the series, began the project with a simple idea. What if Golden Bat was remade with modern technology and a brand new design? So he drafted up some characters, but as the design evolved, he resembled Golden Bat less and less. Time passed and eventually they settled on a wolf theme instead, and well, you know, the rest is history. He never got that modern show, but everything from the skulls to the gold hero carried over into the final product. So in a way, his spirit lives on, even if most people don't realize it. My favorite design doesn't even come from a show. Japanese publication Out Magazine did a joke issue with fake Gundam designs, and one of them had Golden Bat redesigned as a metal hero mecha. I love this picture so much. Now, Golden Bat is well-loved around the world, but there is one place that takes their love of this series to an entirely different level. I didn't mention it before, but the series was one of the first anime to outsource some of its production to South Korea. This excluded it from their ban on Japanese media at the time, and made him really popular over there. They like him so much, they even made their own movies! Now, I'm not gonna pretend I know what's going on, but it's got Golden Bat fighting a guy in a gremlin mask, which just might be the best thing that I've ever seen. Korea likes him so much that it's kinda hard to tell where one series ends and another begins. You've heard of the anime, you've heard of the movie, but have you heard of Golden Bat Man? It's a South Korean cartoon from 1979 where they combined Golden Bat and Batman into a single character. This thing was apparently popular enough that it led to a live action ripoff in 1990 called Super Beta Man. That's right, Korea loves this series so much that even their bootlegs have bootlegs. The amount of ripple effect that this character had on all hero media is kind of insane. Even one of Osamu Tezuka's very first manga starred Golden Bat. Everything from TV to movies has his fingerprints on it, and I can't even imagine what anime would be like if he didn't exist. You ever hear of the anime Space Adventure Cobra? The main villain, Crystal Bowie, was probably influenced by this series. He's got a golden skeleton, and he also has Dr. Nazo's claw. I'd say it counts. Okay. 
Now here's a real obscure one. Have you ever played the Sega Genesis game Trouble Shooter? It's a side-scrolling shmup with two anime girls, and one of the bosses looks just like Dr. Nazo. He even has the claws and the four eyeballs. Oh, and in case you were wondering where you've seen him before, he also shows up for a second in Gainax's Daikon 4 short. Gold and Bad has been on Japanese stamps, modern cartoons are still referencing him, and he even had a series of bubblegum, which I'm sure would break all your teeth if you tried to eat it today. I don't think you could find a more important character if you tried. Sadly, most people just don't know about him, and I would pay for somebody to re-release this model kit where he rises from his sarcophagus. Even his toys have history. This thing was so cool that it actually showed up in the Gainax anime Otaku no Video next to a model kit for Minky Momo. And if that doesn't cement him as one of the greatest anime characters of all time, then I don't know what does. Next year marks his 90th anniversary, but it's anyone's guess if we'll ever see him again. Flying through space and time alone, will Golden Bat ever laugh in Evil's face ever again? I'll tell you one thing, that's a secret that only the bats know. <laughs> And that is absolutely everything that I know about this series, and pretty much everything that I could possibly say about it. Did anybody here actually grow up with Golden Bat? And if you did, what'd you call him where you come from? Let me know in the comments below, and if you really like what I do and want this video to reach as many people as possible, then please, leave a comment, leave a thumbs up, that'll really help with the search results, and that'll get this video to as many people as possible. Again, thank you very much for seeing this video all the way to the end. I will see you guys next time. Take care.